How many of you have heard of Selenium before? Okay. How many of you have have a good idea of what Selenium is and what it does? Okay. How many of you have used Selenium? Okay. And how many of you use Selenium on a regular basis? Okay. So I may have targeted this a little bit low based on the show of hands that I just got. But uh, we'll see how we do. So I started out with just an introduction of what Selenium is, and it looked like there might be a couple of people who this will help. Um, so basically, well, I'll introduce three characters. We've got Alice, Bob, and Carol. And yes, I blatantly ripped them off from cryptography demonstrations. Um, Alice works for a small company. Her boss just asked her to get a bunch of data from alicebain.com. She's becoming overwhelmed with the amount of data and how many times she's going to have to click to get all of the data that they need. Bob works for a slightly larger company that makes a web application, and it just keeps breaking. So they finally decided they need some sort of testing to see so that they can get a reasonable assurance each time they make a change that they haven't broken it again. And he's been testing things manually and is realizing that this is going to get really boring really fast. And Carol is friends with both of them and is about to help them both out, but doesn't know that yet. How's that for a quick answer? <laughs> so one day they all go out to lunch together because um, they're all good friends. And Alice starts talking about her problem first. And Bob says, well, I've got this work that I'm doing and it's just getting boring and I'm having to do the same thing over and over. And, and Alice speaks up and talks about how she's experiencing basically the same problem, but with a, a different set of tasks. And finally there's a break in the conversation between Alice and Bob and Carol speaks up and says, well, have you thought about using Selenium? And both Alice and Bob speak in unison, what's Selenium? And she says, well, Selenium is a tool for automating manual browser tasks. You can use it from most popular programming languages and it provides an API that you can use to automate your repetitive tasks getting the information you need, Alice, and checking that the parts of the application, parts of your application are working properly, Bob. So, a very quick example here, and this screen is not as wide as the one I was testing on, so I apologize in advance if something goes off the right side. So, I'm going to pull up a terminal here, and let's do this scratch, actually. So just from Python here, I'm importing the web driver library from the Selenium package. And then we'll instantiate a Firefox object out of that. grab everybody's favorite example page. And of course I'm not connected to the network. So that's a good test, I guess. <laughs> The test uh, succeeded in telling us that we're not going to do it. Okay. So, so obviously those three lines of code 
um, loaded the web driver interface, started Firefox, and asked Firefox to load google.com, which then failed to load. So going a little bit further, um, once we have the google.com page up, the line here will find the Q element on that page, which is, if you've ever looked at the source code of the, the Google homepage, is the search field where you type your, your query. And storing that in the search underscore field variable here. And then once we have that, we can send, use the send keys function or method to send the word koala and that'll type it into the search field. And then here I'm using something that I set up up here to send the enter key in. And so the, the keys object that's created here just contains a lot of the, the common key bindings so that you can refer to the keys by name and not have to remember, uh, well, uh, enter is, uh, uh, was it hex zero D or hex zero A? It's it's one of those, and so we're able to refer to it by its symbolic name here as a result. And then hitting enter, of course, that triggers Google to do the search and bring back the new page. And then on that new page, we can do another find element. This time. Instead of doing the find by name, we're finding by text, the text that is within a link. And in this case, we're looking for the images link. And then we can click on that. And just see if the network came back. It did not. OK. So I wanted to actually demonstrate that because it's kind of cool to see it in action, but it's not going to work without the network. Um, so supported languages and platforms include C++, um, .NET, JavaScript, Java, um, Python, and Ruby. And I was using Python for the demonstration that I showed earlier. And actually, Python 3 support just landed uh, a little bit ago, and I got to help with getting that ready to go into the most recent release. Um, supported browsers include Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Opera, and PhantomJS. And for those of you who are not, oh. I think that those were all of my demonstrations, so I should be okay for that. Um, if you've not heard of PhantomJS, it's basically a, a WebKit-based browser that does not try to display to a screen. So you can use it where you need the interactions that a browser would provide, but you don't care about it actually displaying somewhere, which makes it great for doing things that are automated using Selenium. Um, so there's one guy that I talked to that his company was actually using PhantomJS to collect data from various providers that didn't have a public API that they could tap into. Um, elements on the page can be found by class name, by CSS selector, by the ID attribute, link text, the name attribute, um, text that would show up within a, a link, not being the whole link, but just a portion of the link text, um, the name of the tag, or an XPath expression. And once you've found the element, you can interact with it in various ways. You can check whether it's displayed, enabled, or selected. You can clear it if it's a form field that can have content. Um, you can click on it. You can find the parent elements, 
element or call any of the, the find methods on the element itself to find any element that's within it. Um, you can get the you can get the attributes, the values of attributes or uh, CSS properties, the ID size, tag name or text. You can find the location within the window of that element. And there are two different methods for that. One that scrolls it into view first. So um, I think the other one, if I remember correctly, just errors if it doesn't, if it's not currently within the viewport. And there are more complex interactions that can be created by using what's called action chains, like drag and drop and so on. Um, you can also use the send keys to type into a field or submit. And I have duplication on that slide, so I'll fix that later. Um, now, when, when you're searching for elements, it's important to remember that every page that you load can take a different amount of time to load. And it depends on the, the server load, network conditions, all sorts of things to they all factor into how long the page takes to load. And so when you're finding an element, you may not find it just because the page hasn't loaded yet. So by default, Selenium has a what it calls an implicit wait that is set at three seconds. So anytime you do a find call to look for an element, it'll wait up to three seconds for that element to appear within the page. And the, uh, that implicit weight value can be changed. So if you have a lot of pages that you know are going to take a little bit longer, then you can turn it up to five seconds or even 30 seconds or whatever you want to set it to. Or you could turn it way down if you're doing performance testing and you want to make sure that everything that you do responds within a second or within half a second. You can do that as well. Um, if you, yes? For that implicit wait, um, is that just on the load of the page, or is it can it be applied like, after you load the page? Maybe very good question. That in a content and then look for something to show up. So it does apply to all every call that you make to a find element function. Okay. So if you load a page and then try to find the the queue element like we would have done on the the Google page, then then it'll wait up to three seconds for that to appear. And then once you type the text into the search field, there are other elements that appear dynamically on that page. And if you then immediately try to search for one of those, then it'll wait up to that implicit wait time again for those to appear. And if it's already there, then it doesn't wait. So it doesn't slow things down having that. But if, if it is something that we're waiting for the page to load it dynamically. We don't have to um, like do a sleep or something to wait for it to show up. We can just let Selenium's built-in implicit wait feature take care of that for us. Okay. And then if you need finer control, um, there's a feature called explicit waits, which basically you, um, at least in the Python bindings, you create a web driver wait object and you give it a length of time that it will wait and a callback function that it will call periodically until it either returns the element that's being sought or reaches the timeout. And so that way, if you know, for instance, that when you get to one particular step in a series of actions that it's going to take up to 20 seconds for the server to return and that's okay, then you might have an explicit wait there for the 20 seconds so that you can do that without changing the implicit wait value so that the other stuff still errors if it isn't found within three seconds. Yes, Tim? It comes in really handy to do that kind of a wait when you have a page with a redirect because it will start the three seconds on the redirect page and not on the page you're on. So if there's a loading time there, it'll error out easier. 
So doing this kind of a wait lets you put a longer time out. It's really nice. Very good point. So as you're writing an automation script or as you're writing a test or a suite of tests, there you quickly run into a problem where all of the, the ways that you're finding the elements on the page, you end up typing those out every time. And it could be CSS selectors or grabbing things by ID or whatever it is. And every time that you write that, obviously, is another place that you're going to have to go back and change it if the page changes. And so if you're, um, say, scraping from, from a site and they have a particular way that they've named their elements in the past, but then they release a new version of the site. Now all of those have changed and your automation script is broken and you have to go back and change it in all those different places. Also, um, whole workflows can change. Which elements are on different pages can change. Um, yes? Oh, sorry to interrupt. I, I was just curious. So, Selenium is, is uh, what we use to drive the browser. Yes. But writing the tests, that's the responsibility of, say, Python, where you, you say you write expectations or assertions. Or right. Like um, so, each <coughs> language has a number of different test frameworks that are available. And Selenium is completely agnostic to that. So, you can choose whichever test framework you want in any language, and it'll just work with it. So. Selenium is just used to drive the browser and to get the information back from the browser, and then you can make your assertions about that information once you have it. <coughs> um, so yeah, uh, whole workflows can also change so that an element that used to be on the first page in a multi-step form might be moved to the second page or even to the last page, and any number of other things can can change about the workflow. And even if the workflow isn't changing, if you're doing the same set of steps in various tests or various automation scripts, then it becomes a maintainability problem there as well because if you want to change the particular way that you're doing it, then you have multiple places where you have to make those changes. So, uh, typo, sorry. Um, the not going to fix it right now. Not <laughs> going to fix it right now. Room full of QA people, you might as well fix it. We can all read it. It's all right. We can <laughs> find the right. You know, it's a really low level bug. I would say it's probably not that not worth fixing. <laughs> It's like a feature to me. But it is outside place. It is. Yeah. I feel better now. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else feel better now? <laughs> no, I do. Okay. So, the solution for the first problem um, came out first, and that is called page maps. And basically, that's using any key value data type. So in Python, that's a dictionary. In uh, Perl, that would be a hash. In, uh, in other languages, it goes by different names. But it's basically the same sort of thing. And so you create names for what you want to call the different elements within the page. And those become the keys in that data structure. And you associate those with either the, the CSS selector, if you can use CSS selectors throughout, or the XPath selector, if you can use XPath throughout, or even better, a, a short sequence that has the type of uh, selector that you want to use and the, the string representing that particular selector. So um, say the string CSS and then whatever CSS selector would be the second element within that sequence. And then you can pass those as they are to 
the, the various find element methods. And that way if something does change and Google decides that the search field should no longer be called Q, then you just go in and you change the, the value that's associated with the search field key and everything that's using that particular uh, page map automatically gets that information and you've had to change it in one place. Um, a little bit more advanced is page objects, which can build on the page maps. So you can now use, um, use attributes within an object to represent the different selectors that you're doing. So you might have a, <coughs> within the page object, you might have a self dot search underscore field. And then that would be, that variable would contain the, the sequence that we referred to before. But it also allows you to add methods to it. So that you can have a login method that might take arguments of a username and a password. And it would take, it would automate the whole process of within the page, finding the username field and filling that in, finding the password field, filling that in, and then hitting the submit button, and even making sure that the next page indicates login success, and possibly throwing an error otherwise. Um, so, <coughs> wow, I'm 20 minutes in, so we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, so, more information can be found on seleniumhq.org and the official documentation is at docs.seleniumhq.org. There's also a mailing list on Google Groups and an IRC channel on freenode.org. And you can get the source either through Google code or <coughs> GitHub and it's sometimes very beneficial to go through and uh, read the source to find out exactly what they're doing and sometimes the comments are even helpful to find out why they are doing it in that particular way. And then this slide is because I was specifically asked to, uh, to include it by El Laskin from the, the IRC channel. And he said, and after you've realized how <coughs> awesome Selenium is, get yourself involved with the community, hop in the chat room, submit patches, fix bugs, uh, file issues, etc. And so the places to do that, obviously the, the mailing list, the Selenium channel on Freenode, um, patches and issues can be submitted via either Google Code or GitHub, previously mentioned, and obviously help answer questions on both the mailing list and on IRC when you feel that you can. And this is my last slide. So it just has my contact info, and then a link to these slides, uh, the GitHub repository that contains these slides, this whole presentation. And along with Selenium, in this presentation I was using Python and deck.js for the slides. So questions, please uh, to fill up about 20 minutes, 30 minutes? <laughs> yes. You talked about timing a little bit, but I hate timing because if you have an app that sometimes is going to take forever or it's going to come back fast, you either write it inefficient or will fail sometimes. But can you, is there stuff to, so that you can say, don't do this until the load completes? Or can you talk a little bit about that? So I guess I didn't explain that as well as I could have before. Um, so the. <coughs> The point of the, the implicit weights and the explicit weights is that it will continue looking for those elements until it finds them, and as, as long as the timeout hasn't expired. So as soon as it finds it, it'll continue on. Um, so it, this is very different from like a static uh, sleep pause, where you say sleep for five seconds and then do this, um, which it's something that I've seen a lot in tests in the past, and really, there's always a better way to do it. 
there's always some condition that you can watch for to make sure that uh, to make sure that the next step can yeah, probably that's, that's execute. Okay. And so yeah, these both the explicit and the implicit weights are already doing that, um, and it's just a matter of whether you want to have one uh, timeout value that you use throughout your script, or whether you want for just a single find call to have a different timeout for it. Yes? So, <clears throat> in the different browsers that you have configured, do you run them locally or do you have a remote box mm -hmm. that you um, call up with the different? And the follow-up question is, uh, within the same browser, how do you support different browser configs? So, two-part question. Um, the first part, um, Selenium can actually be used either way. It can either be used with all of the browsers that you're testing being installed locally, or it can have, um, there's a, a project called Selenium Grid, which expands a little bit, and actually allows a single um, connection point, a single URL that, the, the, that you pass to the, the browser instance when you fire it up from the language bindings, to a single point that you connect to, so that could be on a remote server or locally. But then instead of connecting to a Selenium server instance, it's connecting to a Selenium grid instance, which then proxies those requests out to whichever Selenium servers that it's aware of and have the, where's power? Behind you, little Okay. Okay. Um, whichever ones that it knows of that have the correct capabilities. So you end up passing the capabilities information to the constructor and then Grid will find the right server that has the right browser with the right configuration. Um, and so, kind of half mentioned there that the capabilities can be used to, to select browsers that have different configurations, but it's also possible with Selenium to, after you've instantiated the, the browser, to say, modify the configuration within Firefox after it's loaded. And so if you want to test uh, different settings that you could find in about config, for instance, then you can make those changes after the browser's running, and then those will be effective through the rest of the browser's life. What's that called so I can go to it? Is it um, dynamic browser config, or? Let me see if I can. I unfortunately don't I'll have I'll send that. you an email. Okay, that works. And another question here? Actually, I was comment. just going to comment on, you can also use browser profiles. You can well, call browser I'm, profile. I'm, I'm familiar with name, browser yes. profiles. And you yeah. can also add and create cookies and delete cookies from within the calls also mm -hmm. to help completely customize what you're trying to get. Yeah, so that actually reminds me, um, for at least Firefox, there is a, a Firefox profile object that you can instantiate, set the config, and then you can pass that into the Firefox constructor. Um, okay. so, so, so the last I was aware is you had to have different file paths to each of your different Firefox configs, and that's no longer needful? Yeah, that's no longer necessary. You can still do it that way, but you don't have to. Okay. And this was to test a browser with one extension installed on it as opposed to a computer. Right. Yeah. And that'll work. So I saw some hands over here. Is this the first one? Good. Uh, so um, what uh, functionality does Selenium have for waiting for when things change and not necessarily when they just load it? For example, you have a section on the page that is frequently updated with dynamic content. The section's already loaded. It's already there but it might frequently change. Is there any kind of way for you to do explicit or implicit weights to, to, to see when it changes and not necessarily when it's loaded? So I believe the explicit weights can be used for that. And you would just create your callback so that it called a find element within it. And 
um, then checks the, the value, whatever it is initially, and then continue checking it and then returns true only when it was different. Yes? So what would be the best practice for if you already have a larger test suite to run all the tests? Um, as far as best practices, there are several different ways of running the tests. Um, one that I've used a little bit and hope to use a lot more is using Jenkins to fire off the, the script that runs the tests. Um, but there are many, many other ways. Basically, any, any con continuous integration system or you can even fall back to cron jobs run on a periodic basis or any other tool that will run a job on a periodic basis and collect its results. Yes. I've heard of guys um, on their automated testing set up like a try three times if it passes once type thing. Do you have any comments on that? Sorry, repeat again? So like I've heard of people who run Selenium tests and oftentimes they'll fail and they just kind of, um, if they run three times, they'll maybe fail once and pass twice. Or, mm -hmm. um, and so they've attributed it to you know, maybe some flakiness um, in, in Selenium. And uh, so they'll set up like, you know, run this three times, as long as we get one pass, that's we're good to go. Um, do you have yeah. any comments on that? Um, well, and I can actually see that going either way, because in, in some cases, if, if you really suspect that it's something in Selenium itself, then yeah, running it multiple times and calling it a pass if any of those runs succeeded would be acceptable. But in my experience, a lot of times the, the flakiness is actually in the, in the application, and so you can experiment with different implicit wait times, for instance, to see if maybe it just needs a little bit more time in one place than it does in another. Um, and that may indicate that some performance testing would be uh, recommendable, um, in which case you would turn the, the implicit wait, time, wait times down to what you expect everything to finish within, and then collect those fails. Um, and so yeah, it, it just depends on where you think the problem actually is. But in my experience, the flakiness is usually not in Selenium. And Selenium's pretty stable in my experience. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, I got here late, so I don't want to cover this bit. I'm, so I'm kind of new to Selenium, but is there a way to use it to, I guess, figure out this is actually on this part of the page, say, you know, because I'm working with a bunch of designers right now and they're just kind of driving me nuts because it's like, well, this is five or ten pixels at the wrong place. So, I mean, can you use Selen Selenium to do that kind of stuff or can you get a good idea of just, okay, this is on the bottom half of the page? Or? Um, there are, so there are methods for finding the location of an element, but I think those are relative to the the current view of the window. I haven't used them extensively, but it's possible that those may at least have an option to be called in such a way that you could get it relative to the top left corner of the whole page. Um, so that would be something to check. Or just make sure that it's scrolled all the way up and all the way left, and then, um, and then do the find. And I, I mentioned this earlier, I'm not sure if the that there are two of the get location functions, and one of them scrolls the element into the view first, and the other does not. But I'm not sure whether it just reports the the position relative to the view to the viewport anyway, or whether it returns an error. So that would be something to experiment with. So it will give you like the position of, like this this element on the page. It'll give it relative, relative. to the window at least. Okay. Yes. So then in your test, I mean, you could kind of say, okay, we know it's going to hit here at this point, and that's going to be 10, 20, 50 pixels from the top of the, of the page. So then you could kind of write around that to say that that's probably passing. Or right, or at least compare the, the locations right. of two elements to make sure that 
relative to each other, they're in the correct places. Okay. Yes? So, is it possible to hide the browser in Selenium RC? Hide the browser in what, sorry? Selenium remote control. Um, like to minimize the browser? Or probably use like a virtual machine to get the uh, browser open in different machine actually, can it do that? Yeah, through Selenium Grid it is possible to to run on a remote machine so that it's not tying up a display locally. Okay. Um, and then there's also the option of using Phantom JS, which does not try to do a display at all. Does that answer? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and one more question. Okay. So can Selenium integrate itself UI? Um, Selenium itself um, has has an API that uh, that it speaks over the over the wire. And I'm not sure if that's intended as an actual API, but I don't think it's SOAP. Um, so if you, whatever language you're running the, your Selenium scripts in, um, should have a SOAP library that you can use to, to do various things, but I'm not sure if you mean, um, do you mean like you're doing RPC calls to the Selenium server, or? Uh, I'm never using it, it's just a random question. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I would expect that in most Selenium, most scripts that are using Selenium, if they need to do SOAP work, then they would pull in a separate library for that. Okay. Yes? So just kind of going off this Phantom JS, uh -huh. um, so that's an actual browser in itself. Um, yes. So like if you want to test Firefox headless. Well, you, yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't do that using Phantom JS because Phantom JS is not Firefox. Right. Um, it's it's a completely separate browser. Um, so if if you're wanting to do testing of various different browsers and not tie up a display locally, then Selenium Grid would be the way to go. Um, but if you're just doing something, uh, just doing some automation against a remote site, or if if you're testing the site and you're not concerned about browser differences, then you could use uh, yeah. Phantom JS just fine. So the Selenium Grid, you don't need to be hooked up to uh, to a display. That's well. The, the machines that are the grid nodes each need to have a display if they're running browsers other than Phantom. Okay. So there is an option to, to, to still run it without like an actual display. To run which, sorry? To run the browsers. Um, well, the browsers will all ask for a display except for Phantom JS. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of where is that browser? Where is that display? So if you're running a, a headless server somewhere that has a video card, it's running X or it's running Windows or it's running Mac OS X, um, then it'll be able to display to that, uh, it'll be able to use that display even if there's not a monitor connected. Um, but if you want to run in an environment where it's beneficial to not even use the resources for a display, uh, even if it's not actually going to a monitor, then Phantom JS would be the answer to that. Yes? Um, a while ago I was using one, and um, I could use the rejects to find any text on a page. Is there something similar to link to that? Like, so I don't have to find it based on any of the the element IDs or anything, just, was that XCOM, um, or is that the closest it comes? So, there is an option to do that for links. It's yeah, a partial link one, yeah, I know, but I don't, I haven't found anything in Selenium that's, and I was just wondering if it was something. Yeah, not to just search the entire page for anything containing a, a particular word. Um, not that I'm aware of, anyway. It's possible that it's there and I just haven't encountered it yet. But uh, in preparing the, 
the slides for this, I actually looked through the find element functions and uh, cataloged them and did not see anything that would. So, like make for that dynamic fun. testing, like creating, you know, like a new task or something, a program really takes task or something. Um, what would what would you recommend for like you created the task and then it shows up on your web page? And most times, if it's using JavaScript or something, there's not really going to be the unique part of that task is just the title of it. Right. Would Would you use just the CSS tucker? So what I would actually do in that case, um, there are elements of the, the location of that text that you will know. So, um, and I actually have experience with, with doing this for one of the applications that, um, that we test at Bluehost. And that is that we have a, a task section at the top of one of our main tools that keeps track of information that's, keeps track of what tasks are processing for an account. And that's dynamic, it changes on a fairly regular basis. And so what I did is there's a, a multiple find version of each of the find functions. So there's find element by name, and there's also find elements by name. And using the find elements version of one of those functions, I can pull out all of the, the list items that are within this particular region of the page. And then I can do my processing on those in the script. So, so in my case, I actually pulled them out and created a data structure within the script that I was then able to uh, create an API around so that other scripts could call into that and say, find me the task that matches this criteria. Just yes. real quick to that, if you run water, it's like a chance or something on the page. Water. Yeah, water is really nice for adding some functionality like That's that. That's W-A-T-I-R? Okay. That's easy to use. That's cool. Yeah, I've not tried that, but I'll have to look into it. Yes? Uh, can someone test Windows applications? Um, it's specifically for automating browsers. So anything that is a browser or is presented in a browser it would be able to help you with. Um, but if you were trying to do a, a purely desktop application within Windows, it would not be of any help. You can use uh, when the Visual Studio Professional as they'll do that'll do desktop. Okay. Yes. Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? I'm having so trouble hearing. We use this complaint in our company. Okay. So, are there any advantages to selling, using Selenium for test complete? Um, is test complete a testing framework? So, I, I'm not familiar. It is. Uh, okay. Yes, we usually use uh, for automating our web applications using test complete. So. And other than being open source, do you think can be uh, anything else that you benefit us? Well, being open source is a benefit, um, but with a name like Test Complete, it sounds like it's pretty focused around testing, probably. I, and I can't speak specifically about it because I'm not familiar with it. But uh, one of the benefits of Selenium is that it is possible to do a lot more uh, types of automation other than just automated testing. Yes? I actually looked at test complete before we started really getting into Selenium okay. as a positive alternative. Um, test complete, when at least when I looked at it, it didn't have, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't on all the operating systems. So like in our environment, we would make sure like everything works in Linux and in Mac. And so test complete didn't have clients for, I don't think they had like a Linux client, which is really important to us. So for the cross-platform, Selenium was a better choice. I think this company might think of the cross-browser testing actually. Well, but I looked at it. This was a while ago. Cross-browser. Yes? What are the uh, best practices and maybe any gotchas with um, file uploading and downloading? 
than trying to control the browser with something. Um, that's a really good question. Um, as far as downloading, um, I would generally caution against doing that using Selenium, just because it, unless if so, if you're testing a web application to make sure that the download happens correctly, when you go through the the particular um, the steps within the web application, then then that would be a situation where you could use Selenium to do the download. Uh, but in general, the, the the download boxes are hard to automate, and the hooks just aren't there, and a lot yeah, of other things. So you may be able to make it as far as making sure that the the download dialog appears. But <coughs> at that point, a lot of people tend to get stuck. Um, as far as uploading, I just don't have any experience with that. I ask because our our platform has um, very frequent upload and download by users, and so I was just curious if it really could help in that area. Yeah, for for downloads, typically, as long as it's just a a fixed URL, if, and if what, if what you care about is getting the, the data out, then it's better to use a command line tool like Perl or an API a similar API. library or an API. I think the upload will work. Just send key and type. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can send key and file name to the file and the <coughs> Okay, thank you. Yes. Does Selenium have any, I guess, hooks for altering proxy settings of various browsers? Yes, it does. And uh, that comes into the, uh, the, the profile settings. And so the way you'll set that will vary from browser to browser. And the amount of support for it may also vary from browser to browser. At this time. Uh, but I haven't done a whole lot with that, so I'm not sure. <coughs> Is that all you needed? Uh, it is. It would be a place to start. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you have much experience uh, interacting with APIs directly with Selenium. Um, so that's actually one of the things I was considering covering in the slides. So if you're working with a web application that has a published API, and if all you need to do is get the data out of it or get data to it or in other ways interact with with that site, and if the API provides all of the functionality that you need, which most APIs are pretty complete, then I would not recommend using Selenium for that. Um, one example is a relatively common question. People will come into the, the Selenium IRC channel and ask, how do I add an attachment in Gmail using Selenium? And the answer that they invariably get back from the, the core Selenium team is Gmail has a published API. It's really good. <coughs> Unless you're working for Google and your job is testing Gmail, don't do it. Don't automate Gmail through Selenium because they have an API, so use the API. Uh, uh, yes? Uh, I guess more specifically, like um, we have some web apps that obviously you can't um, interact with with Selenium, but I'd like to test the um, test um, the web app. Um, uh -huh. You know uh, the result of the web app uh, in Selenium okay. with the web browser. So I was just wondering if you um, if you have much experience like posting data or stuff like that. With um, so you said that. You said that it's an app that you are not able to automate with Selenium? Yeah, well, we have a mobile of... aspect of it as well, some mobile APIs that all integrate together. OK, so this is this a, a mobile version of the site that um, you're trying to test, or? Yeah, yeah, basically. well, kind of. Uh, not, not, it's actually a mobile application, but the API from the mobile application is what I'd like to, to use. OK. so. So yeah, in that case, um, the better option would be to write the test um, to use whatever mechanism that API is written to use instead of trying to drive a browser to do it. Unless 
you're able to make one of the, like there's early Android support that is coming. And so you may be able to drive either an Android simulator or um, something like that to, to get the same, the same result that you're looking for without having to duplicate a lot of the, the calls that the mobile platform would make. But, uh, but yeah, you, you would need either the application, to use Selenium at least, you would need the application in the phone to be using a browser to do that. Um, if, it's, if it's a native mobile application, then you would need to use a different sort of uh, technique to get there. Yes. Uh, you did mention Perl on your supported list. Is there something wrong with Perl's interface to Selenium? There actually is. Um, so <laughs> why is it inferior to other languages? So the the place where I work is has been primarily a Perl shop, and we actually started out our Selenium testing using a, a Perl a set of Perl bindings. Um, but as far as I can tell at this point. Those are not being maintained, and they're not in the. Uh, I was specifically listing the officially supported languages, and it, so the fact that they're not in the Selenium project itself is why it wasn't listed there. But then, in trying to use the the bindings, there were some issues that I even submitted patches for that are still not fixed in the main line of the the Perl bindings because they just haven't been accepted. <coughs> so, yeah, it was kind of sad to encounter that. Anybody else? Okay. I'm just curious, I, I was just on the Selenium website, that you can also just automate it, random web, web tasks, you know, something that you should be doing over and over again. Have you done anything cool like that that wasn't necessarily testing related, but there's just something you wanted to automate? I've not done that yet. I have a few ideas in the back of my mind for things that I'd like to do along those lines, um, but nothing that I've taken the time to do just yet. Um, really looking forward to those projects. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for all the awesome questions. Great participation. And uh, I think we're about out of time, so thank you very much.